to speak on my favorite subject. Uh, this is something that has consumed much of my uh, professional life. I know in the program it says 22 years, but I was doing my calculations the other day, and uh, I started actually in 1992 doing endoscopic ear surgery. And what I want to do in the next half an hour is give you an idea of the way what the endoscope, the different views that the endoscope had given me of the disease process that we all worried about and the, uh, the surgical field, the, the middle ear cleft that we operate in. I'm also going to give you some hints about areas where I think the endoscopes give you a tremendous advantage, such as uh, in the retrotympanum, and also the fact that the endoscope is primarily designed for transcanal access. So if you just step back and look at chronic ear surgery, what we do, and I think if you, basically what we do is that we just fix the bad of the scars. If there is a perforation, we fix it. If there is a, uh, a discontinuity in the ossicular chain, we end up restructuring it. But we really try very, very hard to ignore the underlying process of a lack of ventilation or poor ventilation or a station tube dysfunction. We all uh, think in the back of our mind that this, has, this is the process that has caused the patient to come into our uh, clinic, but we try to ignore it because we've all been told that we should ignore it. Say, uh, a station tube is a dangerous place. We should first forget about it. And if you're really looking uh, for good hearing results, uh, hearing results equals well-ventilated middle ear cavity. I've always been surprised by all this effort that we put in into designing uh, little twists about our prosthesis, but we really come down to it. The reason our patients do poorly in terms of hearing, especially in the long term, it is the lack of a well-ventilated middle ear cleft. And a very good part of our failures in chronic ear surgery is really related to the lack of ventilation. So I think it really is peculiar for us to ignore all of that and really focus on just fixing the battle scars. And to me, the most irritating part about the way we practice chronic ear surgery is our fixation on the mastoid. Because really, cholesteatoma is not a mastoid disease. Cholesteatoma spills into the mastoid. But cholesteatoma is a tympanic cavity disease. And when we fail, we do not fail in the mastoid. We fail within the tympanic cavity. So I think the reason that we ended up being focused on the mastoid is the surgical or is the visualization instrument that we have at our hand. And namely the fact that when you use the microscope, and you're really trying to do a middle ear surgery or tympanic cavity disease, of course your field of view is limited by the narrowest segment of the ear canal. And this is a very, very different situation when using the endoscope because you bypass that and you're basically almost stepping into the tympanic cavity. So even when using a zero degree endoscope, you end up seeing around the corner. So I think what has happened or what has transpired is that the, uh, we decided to create a parallel route, which is the mastoid cavity, to gain access into the areas that we all, we all care about. And I think if you observe any experienced surgeon work, you recognize that he rushes through the mastoid part to gain, and he spends a lot of time peeking into the tympanic cavity from the mastoid. And that, to me, the most outrageous example of this is the way we approach the facial recess, is that we create a mastoid cavity, we posterior tympanotomy, we go in between the nerve and the, uh, and the corda to gain a very limited keyhole access. While if you are doing endoscopic surgery, within five minutes in a cadaver and within probably 10 to 15 minutes, I could tell you, I could show you this view. The facial recess stops being a recess. It ends up being just a little depression on the back wall of the tympanic cavity. And this is the picture that I always like to show, to show the kind of exposure that you get, or the kind of access that you get into the tympanic cavity. And this is, of course, a transcanal picture. And mostly, if you are a microscopic transcanal surgeon, you will probably be able to, to see this area. 
And the cochlear, it should surprise you that the cochlear form process is the center of your field because usually when you're using, micro, when you're using the microscope, it represents the most interior part of your uh, field and you're lucky to see it. But the cochlear form process is the anatomic center of the tympanic cavity. And I think what the endoscope does is that it brings you into the anatomic center of the cavity. So you could basically have this tremendous access. And if you had to do this with the microscope, you have to really take out, destroy much of the TMJ, destroy much of the mastoid, destroy the uh, vertical segment of the facial nerve. So it's a very, very different approach and very, very different axis. And this is why you get this kind of a picture. So basically, if you want to know why I do endoscopic surgery, is that I'm discovering the natural axis into the tympanic cavity. And the wide field view of the endoscope allows me to gain access into the tympanic cavity, which is the birthplace of cholesteatoma. So this is something that I've been doing for a while, and this is a, something that I have done on the workstation in my hospital. This is uh, nowadays with, a, uh, uh, with the newer CT scanners, you could do a Valsalva while the patient is getting a CT scan. So in a very significant number of patients, you could really see the whole ventilation system of the uh, temporal bone. And uh, this is a 3D reconstruction of the air containing spaces. And I just want to just tell you that, show you how I think counterintuitive our fixation on the mastoid is that if you look at the air cell system, of course, you see the station tube, which is the isthmus and middle ear cavity. And our focus on the most downstream part of the ventilation system is unbelievably counterintuitive. If you have some, if you had showed this to a 15-year-old guy who doesn't know anything about medicine, he'll probably tell you that you have to look at the upstream part. And he will point probably to this area here, that this is a very narrow area, and you need to, uh, you need to take care of it. I have to say to Robert that I, 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 come from, I come from Dubai, and Dubai is 40 degrees, and I've never felt so hot. <laughs> you can see that. But you are here to suffer. All right, thank you. So this is, this is, the, um, uh, this is something that he had done, published in the uh, laryngoscope. And again, in about 20% uh, of the patient, you do visualize the whole length of the eustachian tube. And this is not patchless eustachian tube. This is just a normal population. And in almost 96% of patients, you will be able to distend the distal part of the eustachian tube. So this is the data, but basically this is what I have done, is that I tried to look at the site of the eustachian tube obstruction in chronic ear surgery, and this is published on the laryngoscope. And the point is, or, is that in significant part of our patients, the most common site is at the isthmus. Really, the distal eustachian tube that have, you, if you heard people talking about dilating it, it's unbelievably wide. It just, you know, you, this is not the site of the obstruction. And I think there is data to indicate that. So basically, again, what the endoscope does is allows you to look, and you could actually see the opening of the cartilaginous eustachian tube into what people have been calling the bony eustachian tube. But in, again, there's so many things that changes when using the endoscope, because to me, the idea of a bony eustachian tube does not exist. What they're calling the bony eustachian tube is just the protympanum, and the eustachian tube is really just a cartilaginous uh, structure. And you could see that this opening here of the cartilaginous eustachian tube into the protympanum really looks very, very much like the opening of the eustachian tube into the nasopharynx. It has this kind of a uh, protrusion or a cuff-like uh, protrusion into the, into the protympanum. So to me, the eustachian tube is a purely cartilaginous uh, structure. And this is a patient that I have done. This is the picture that you see on the left is not the pre-op picture. It's a post-op picture. The patient uh, did 
uh, have surgery endoscopically uh, almost six years ago, and the patient uh, healed, and then he reperforated again. And just to give you the power of indoctrination is that I have been doing this endoscopic surgery for a good, again, 24 years. At that time, I had been doing it for almost 16 years. I knew that your station tube is probably a, an issue, and I never really bothered just to take a 30-degree endoscope and look at the eustachian tube. But the next time I did, and this is what I found, basically a, a completely obstructed eustachian tube at the area of the isthmus. So I decided to do a transtympanic dilatation, and this is the picture after the dilatation. Now, of course, I'm not saying go ahead and do this. I'm not saying I have the answer. But I'm saying that we have a very different access with the endoscope, and we have an opportunity to look at what we're doing, look at the initial pathology, and possibly do something about that. And this is a, this is a, a different case. And you can see here that there is a posterior retraction. The patient, I think, had been saved by a, an anterior perforation. Otherwise, he would have had a much worse uh, situation. So I'm doing my bisection. I always start with a very uh, white-based uh, tympanometer flap, elevating the retracted areas of the tympanic membrane into the middle ear. The nice thing I think about the endoscope that I hope you appreciate here is the idea that you really see the whole thing almost every whole middle ear space and the whole ear canal almost every second of the way. So you have, you don't have really to manipulate your um, your microscope all the time to see different areas of the tympanic cavity. So looking at the, again, the, uh, let me just see if I can put it back a bit. So look at the, it's the same thing. You see obstruction of the, of that area of the protympanum, inserting the balloon catheter. Inflating it, withdrawing it, and again looking, it looks like a very, very different uh, anatomy, which is again, I don't have to tell you, it's really impossible to see with the microscope. And the nice thing about endoscopic is surgery, when you do your reconstruction, you could basically make sure that your graft does not fall onto the opening of your station. So, as I explained, I think the most important area for ventilation is the isthmus. But when you look at, again, at all these air-containing spaces, you get to appreciate that this space here, the tympanic cavity, is very, very different from these other cells that lie within the mastoid and the attic cavity. And you could almost draw a line in between the tympanic cavity, or the mesotympanum, and the attic area. And this line has been drawn long, long time ago, uh, <coughs> Professor Arts, uh, which when he described the epitympanic diaphragm, the idea that the middle ear spaces or the air spaces within the temporal bone is divided into two areas, a posterior superior part and an inferior part. And these two areas are very, very different anatomically. They look different and they have a different function. So morphologically here, superiority, you get a lot of excrescences. Uh, inferiority is a very smooth uh, walled cavity. And superiority here, you get a lot of cuboidal cells, very simple system just for ventilation. Inferiority, you get mucociliary clearance. And what makes the epitympanic diaphragm uh, anatomically is basically the fact that the lateral attic is closed off 
ventilation-wise from the mesotympanum tympanum with the lateral incudomalia and the lateral malia uh, ligamentous fold. And that, if you think here anteriorly, there is a ventilation, of course, the tensor fold uh, st stops you from ventilating this way. So the only place for ventilation is through the isthmus, medially, and then uh, laterally. And this is looking at the isthmus with a 30-degree uh, endoscope uh, in between the incudostipedia joint and the tensor uh, tendon. And you can see the tensor fold, and you see the famous cock. So this is the isthmus, and this is the ventilation port of the mastoid cavity. So this is also one of my patients. Uh, you could see that this is a left ear. And I'm not pointing, I'm not talking about these little adhesions, but this is, I'm covering the, uh, the tendon of the tensor with my suction. This is the incudocipedia joint. And you can see there's a very thick fibrous tissue that's even pulling in the corda tympani. So there's a complete closure of the, uh, of the isthmus, which is the ventilation of the attic and the mastoid. While in the middle ear cavity, you have a basically a normal situation. So when you look at the CT scan, it, again, this is understandable. The mastoid cavity is poorly developed. There's, uh, it's uh, because the isthmus, its ventilation is, is blocked. And the only air that you see in the system, actually, you see within the cholecytoma or within the retraction uh, pocket. It's a very, very different situation from a very similar clinical presentation that you see here, where the mastoid is ventilated, and you see that the disease is almost speaking into the mastoid, because this is a very different uh, condition. Uh, this is uh, see this, the patient, and you can see that there is in this patient also cholecytoma in what we think is the attic, but this is a Prusak space cholecytoma. And uh, when I lifted up the tympanometer flap, there was a closure of the posterior pouch of ventral, which is the ventilation port of the um, of the uh, of Prusak space. And this, you could see that uh, here, you can see that this band of tissue has closed up the ventilation of, of Prusak space. And when I looked within the isthmus, the ventilation of the attic proper, you see that there's a open isthmus. This is, of course, Prusak space uh, ventilation. And this is a picture from a Stabies case where you see the ventilation Prusak space in between a membrane that joins together the corda and in between the uh, tympanometer or the eardrum. So this becomes understandable. And I think you need to understand these little differences because I think if you have, for example, a Prusak space called Cetoma, you could bet that you're gonna take it out through a transcanal route. But if you, uh, but if you have a, a, a true obstruction of the isthmus and an actual attic Cetoma or the upper compartment, if you take out, if you do an aggressive eticotomy, you're basically taking out the lateral border of that ventilation. You have a lot of possibility for collapse. So these are not little details. I think these are things that we have to understand. We got, we got to understand how the disease process ended up with what we're seeing in, in the operating room uh, with our patients. So again, this is how uh, this patient uh, presented with basically a normal mesotympanum and an obstructed uh, Prusak space. So the next, so if you don't want to get into a transcanal endoscopic ear surgery, you've got to use the endoscope to look at the retrotympanum. Uh, it is an area that you really don't have answers for with the microscope. So you cannot see this with a microscope. Uh, and uh, we know that a very significant number of our residual disease failure comes from the uh, sinus tympani. And you could, you could do that with a 30 degree endoscope, but you have to position the endoscope differently, look at the back, and you could inspect again the facial recess. And you could, start, you could start to understand the anatomy of that area. And one thing that had really surprised me throughout this process is that I have seen some very experienced 
people who I, call, I would call my teachers really calling things very, very, uh, they're confused about the anatomy of the retro tympanum. It's not that I'm smarter than they are, but I could see things better than they are. I think the subpyramidal space is important. Subpyramidal space sometimes is an extension of the sinus tympani. Sometimes it's an extension of the posterior sinus where you have the stabies. And I always, uh, just to review a bit the anatomy, I always, when I, when I look at the retro tympanum with the endoscope, I try to have a little system. I'm just going to share it with you because I find it very useful. So I look for the stabies, and that's why I have the, what we call the posterior sinus. I look for the uh, round window where we have the subtympanic sinus, and in between it's a sinus tympani. So it's one, two, three. Posterior sinus where you have the oval window, ponticulus, sinus tympani, sepiculum, and subtympanic sinus. So I go one, two, three. So posterior sinus, we have stabies, ponticulus, sinus tympani, sepiculum, and subtympanic sinus. And, of course, we are using the ear canal as a access point. So it's a very, very different operation, and you need to get that into your calculation as you are considering doing the surgery. This is, um, of course, a almost a universal uh, anatomic situation. This is, I think, why Robert has patients uh, upside down. Uh, and I, I also would like to bring this into... A, a vertical orientation because that with the endoscope, one of the great advantages of the endoscope is that you could turn it like this and turn it like this and take really a very, very different view of the anatomy. So if you start like this, you won't be able to have an excursion. But I do it slightly differently. I do uh, put the headrest uh, uh, the long way. And you have, when using the endoscope, you have to align the cartilaginous ear canal with the bony ear canal, uh, because uh, otherwise you won't be able to you won't be able to navigate the cartilaginous ear canal to use the bony canal. So a lot of times I'm using the shaft of the endoscope to push back and to align the cartilaginous with the bony ear canal. Or I sometimes put these stitches in, that basically helps me, basically I put it just beyond that bend and I use it uh, and retract it basically to straighten uh, the ear canal. So this is what we do. So basically, again, when you're doing the scopic ear surgery, you have to worry about the canal, you have to worry about the choice of approach, uh, you have to improve the ear canal access sometimes, and when you're looking, basically, in terms of going through the ear canal, you have two approaches. The first one, if your disease is located in the right place and the ear canal is reasonable, you could do a very wide tympanometer fly like we all do, uh, what was the endoscope. But if you have a restricted ear canal and need to do some canal work, you could basically do what we do with Sheehy lateral graft technique, take out the skin of the ear canal as a free graft and reintroduce it at the end after doing some uh, canal work. So this is one white and flap and I really make it wide. Uh, I go almost parallel to the annulus superiorly and um, uh, inferiorly, so you could see I'm very, very deep. And a lot of times, you know, the disease is very uh, helpful, it's located in the posterior part. But if you have an anterior disease, you have to really uh, select out a very different approach. So this is what I call the lateral canal axis, and basically what we do is we reserve the uh, vascular strip. And basically a sheehy lateral graft technique. Remove the skin of the ear canal. So preserve the vascular strip, take out the whole skin of the ear canal. And I use a lot of pledgets, I tamponade, so there's a lot of little tricks that you could, you could use to do the surgery. Uh, most, most people, most microscopic surgeons, the first thing that comes to their mind, how could you do this? You know, there's bleeding, there's, you know, we've been there before, you know, you're not going to trick us into this. But 
it's a very, very different surgery. You know, if you go with a drill in your hand uh, and big open spaces and you're cutting tissues and stuff, you're not going to be able to do the surgery. Uh, of course, you need a second hand, but this is, you have to choose your way much earlier than that. And in my, in my practice, I don't reserve, and this is also a, a very common uh, answer, or my comments that I hear, well, you know, this is a small cholesteatoma, you're not dealing with our cholesteatomas. But to me, it's not about small, it's not about big. Believe me, I do some very huge cholesteatoma. To me, tympanic cavity disease, you take it out with the endoscope. Mastoid disease, you take it out with, uh, with the microscope. I cannot do a mastoidectomy with, with the endoscope, but I think you should try to do tympanic cavity disease with the endoscope because you get, you help uh, the patient. So this is uh, the main point that I want to make. I always start with the tympanic cavity. I always start removing disease from the tympanic cavity. And if the disease extends into the uh, mastoid, I end up removing it. So uh, this is just a small, nice case. Uh, this is a long, long time ago, almost 20 years ago. The patient had a uh, retraction. This is a small attic osteotoma. So right here, so you see again the sac and how it's going into the attic. A lot of time we do this uh, teasing and you could... I think one other thing that I want to mention is that endoscopic surgery is a very safe surgery because again, you don't have a suction in your hand. So basically, the, it's, uh, you know, if you act too aggressive, you cannot do anything. Uh, so it's... Uh, uh, I think it's surgery as, uh, in ear surgery as it was meant to be. So you see that the costetoma, the retraction pocket has rotated around the incredocipedia joint. So there's just a few examples that I'm not going to show you. Uh, one great thing that has happened with endoscopic ear surgery is the development of a very angled um, suction instrument. And this is a Panetti set, and this is using a 30-degree endoscope. So this is a suction instrument, and this is a very, very long and angled instrument. So I'm really going up in the attic. And uh, see that in just a second. See how I fold it? Because this is a this is a lateral seam circular canal, so I'm very, very high uh, in the attic, removing disease with angled scope and angled instruments. So in terms of reconstruction, this is uh, so, so this is the reconstruction of again like Sheehy's lateral graft technique. I I think I showed that in the lion. Somebody somebody was very interested in it. This is a I don't use gel foam anymore. I use the surgery flow. It's a very similar material, and you just squish it, and within uh, 10 minutes, you could pack uh, every way of that uh, you need to pack. So, uh, what is the, again, this is a lateral graft technique. I always like to cut the slit for the, uh, for the handle of the malleus while the graft is in place because I found that if I cut it before, I end up almost cutting it always in the wrong place. So I'm tucking it under the handle of the malleus. I'm then introducing the skin of the ear canal. And I have this little technique where I fold it around the piece of gel form and uh, introduce that into the, uh, uh, into the ear and then uh, unfold it. So, it is not, again, I, and this is something that has been frustrating me through, throughout my career, that you get the, you know, the establishment and ear surgery, ah, you know, what, what are you doing? You know, we solved this problem a long time ago. And I'm here to say that kind of, if you are a thoughtful surgeon, you cannot tell me that we have figured out chronic ear surgery. You cannot tell me that we have great results with chronic ear surgery. I just, I cannot, I, that statement, I, I know some people make it, but to me it's the most, 
unrealistic, I don't want to be nice with my statement, it's the most unrealistic. I've been there, I've done that, I've done microscopic ear surgery. We do not do well with our chronic ear surgery patient. We need to do better. And uh, I think this is not a problem that has been solved uh, 100 years ago. I think we have a lot to do on that front. At the same time, we should not fool around with stuff that works. And I've mentioned yesterday, stabies and cochlear implants work as they stand. There's no reason to start introducing technology where you know, we could only screw things up. And I think this is a paper that I published in the Lamingo uh, School about uh, some people who had experimented with uh, cochlear implantation and in discovering, they started going into the ear canal and really mucking things up and having complications. So, but chronic ear surgery has not, it's a problem that has not been solved. I know we all talk about, I use this and I do that and I have this implant and I have this way of doing things. But at the end of it, the ventilation issue is something that we need to address. And I think the endoscope gives us a shot at hopefully understanding what's going on and hopefully uh, 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 doing a better job for our patients. Thank you very much. Yes. of the eustachian tube, what balloon do you use? I'm sorry? What balloon catheter are you using to dilate the eustachian tube by the tympanic This is the same, the same balloon catheter that they use for the, uh, for the transnasal uh, dilatation, the, the BET. Um, so it's made by a German company, I think Spiegel, Spiegel and Thijs. Yeah. But it, 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 this is, you know, there is... Um, there's a lot of issues about this uh, that uh, you need to understand in the anatomy of that area before you actually shove a, a catheter into that area. So I, I, again, I, I think what I'm trying to show here is that we have access, we could do a lot more, but of course uh, this is a long process. We haven't uh, established that it works, but I think we have an opportunity to do, to do something in that area. Any, any other question? Sorry, I always have questions. Uh, it was really beautiful work. Um, I have two questions. Just if you can give us an idea of what your setup is like in the OR. How, how are you situated? Are you seated? Are you standing? Are you leaning on something? And uh, secondly, could you talk about the, uh, the risks of the, of the light and whether you can easily burn tissue with the light? Because I think that's been reported. Uh, so basically, you know, uh, th this issue has been looked at, uh, the issue of heat, and I think it's a, uh, it's a very, uh, uh, is this true? okay. So this is the, basically the setup in the operating room. Uh, it's a, a right-handed surgeon would hold the endoscope in the left hand and the monitor, this you could see that this is really old stuff. This was from probably 1994 or 1995. And uh, the, uh, the nurses, uh, to, you know, to your right have the same way basically that we do with surgery, have the instruments close by and really have an access to the, uh, 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 to the monitor. You have to use the uh, longer scopes, you cannot use short scopes. And that's sometimes what uh, ends up uh, driving people the wrong way, is that if you use a short scope, your hand will bump against each other. The heat issue has been addressed by actually multiple publications, both uh, experimental and it, you know, with the endoscope, there's always smudging, you always have to irrigate, you have to take the endoscope out, so it usually is not an issue. And uh, usually the cavity is pretty small, so oh, you don't need that much light to, 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 uh, to have a visualization of the cavity. But you're right, with experience, and I've noticed that myself, initially, again, if you're starting out, the endoscope is out every two minutes. 
every one minute actually, every th half, half a minute. But what, with experience, you do end up, st the endoscope stays in the ear a lot. So it is something that uh, I have become aware of lately, more so than usual, and I have been paying attention to it, uh, withdrawing the endoscope every so often. But again, there has been studies on this and, and published it, it show, indicating that the um, the ear cools out very, very quickly uh, with, the, with the endoscope, and practically you don't have time to cause any damage into the middle ear structures. I wonder, is there any possibility to work B-manually in future with the endoscopes? I know this is a very, the wish of uh, every microscopic surgeon. I know that there's a lot of talk about holders and stuff like that. I never found that to be a, a possibility because you need to introduce the instruments. With those instruments, the endoscope takes a space. Uh, but people have been very uh, interested in this. I think the, uh, what I could see as the most important development, and it's something that have pushed my, uh, my access, I would say 10 times, uh, or made my access 10 times better, is suction instruments. There have been development of suction instruments uh, called Benetti, Benetti set. It's a uh, Italian, Italian, southern Italian surgeon who basically made these instruments himself initially and then went to a company and they started making them. So this is what you've seen when I was doing the uh, dissection in the attic. Um, they have a whole range of uh, different instruments, all with the suction, and I think they, they work beautifully. But uh, people have been, especially Indian colleagues, have been talking about holders and stuff. Um, I have never, s I've never felt that this works for this technique. No. Nussbaumer, Barnsley, Little England. Um, to evaluate for oneself what endoscopic middle ear surgery can do, are you setting yourself up for failure if you just use standard endoscopic sinus surgery endoscopes? Or? Um, I'm sorry, say that again. I no, is it appropriate to use uh, just the endoscope set from endoscopic sinus surgery? I think or in terms of instruments, if you're starting out, uh, in terms of video equipment and scopes, I think you basically could work with the same stuff. It is a, um, it is to, uh, to, uh, to your advantage to have a uh, three millimeter endoscope. And uh, Carl Storz makes a very nice long three millimeter endoscope, which has a wide field of view. But don't use anything any less than that, because the smaller the endoscope, the smaller field of view, so you, if you use a very small endoscope, you end up with the disadvantages of the microscope, which is a limited field of view, and the disadvantages of the endoscope, which is a you know, one-handed uh, one surgery. So small, small scopes do not really work uh, uh, in, um, in this application. And I mentioned, you mentioned the heat issue, and I wanted uh, Robert was telling us about our uh, five-minute stabies. Yes, uh, yes, uh, stabies. So I want to mention. Uh, I think we should do it now if you want. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm just, I'm just actually, I was going to take. One. It's, it's not really a meditation, stabies meditation. It's a stabies pulling your hair out uh, situation. In that, when I started doing endoscopic. Uh, and I'm not advertising it, I don't please, you know, if you're comfortable. You know, I think you have to do uh, five years of endoscopic ear surgery before you get, if you, you know, if you want to do stabies endoscopically. But the, uh, uh, for about three months, I, uh, I always, when I was using the regular wire uh, piston uh, prosthesis, every like two or three cases, I would basically crimp the prosthesis and like almost half a minute later, it goes uncrimped. Crimp it again, it goes uncrimped. Take it out, throw it out, get another one, curse the manufacturer. <laughs> and I went through this almost for two or three months, sleepless nights, thinking, what the hell is going on? 
So did anybody, does anybody have, I mean, I, I, if somebody figures it out right now, I would feel pretty dumb myself because it took me three months yeah, to figure this out. Well, I'm pretty dumb myself. <laughs> <laughs> I woke up at two o'clock. It's basically, yeah, it's basically the fact that uh, it's a memory, the meta memory. And I'm so surprised, you know, it took me, I swear, this was probably the most traumatic experience in my professional life. Uh, just the like frustration of why is it un uncrimping? So I think that when you do new stuff, there's a lot of, I mean, that's, this is also an advice for, for most people is that don't, don't take the less taken, don't, don't take, take the most frequently taken paths because you have very unexpected issues uh, that come up when you're uh, doing things differently. It's good that you remind me because yesterday we missed that. So you have five minute meditation, okay? You're probably bored sick of stabilis surgery by now, so we will make it even shorter. There was the issue about the pimping. And, you know, we have this, I didn't want to have this. Yeah, I'm not on full screen, so. I think we agreed uh, that basically all of the processes somehow work, but we do have problems uh, with processes what have... Uh, can I have your laser pointer again, please? What have loops and... Uh, what we experience then is that we have penetration of uh, those loop wire processes or even dissections of the long incus process. There was this question yesterday whether the erosion of the incus, incus would close again or I think yes, it sometimes does. If you look at this one, this one was stable and it just penetrated. So the, the mucosa probably re-ossifies uh, due to the osteocytes, the, the bone. But that's not the matter. The thing is, if you look at the nutrition of the long incus or of the incus, we have the majority of nutritive vessels in the anterior aspect of our long incus process. So we do not see those nutritional nutritive vessels. And so uh, the second thing is um, the crimping dilemma. If we want to crimp, have a stable, stable uh, crimping around this, we need, would need to over crimp it. Otherwise it always become loose. If you try to fold a paper on a 90 degree table, it will never be 90 degree. You have to fold it over and then it stays 90 degree. And so there is a strong suggestion that the mobility and nutritive aspects cause this uh, dilemma with the uh, long incus um, necrosis. And then again, the long incus process is not in the cross-section circular. 
This is a piece of work by Miklos Todt, and he dissected uh, 50 long incus processes. And if you look at the pattern of uh, the cross sections, the irregular cross section of the long incus process is regular, and the circular cross section is irregular. So we do not need round things which will never fit. So I, we, I think this kind of procedures uh, are very helpful if you don't use laser surgery and they go... It's titanium and on the top is nitinol and, uh, which is very flexible and memorizes its stage. So it's a left ear, I do stabototomy, no, no laser. Uh, take out the posterior part of the um, foot plate and then you just flip those ones on on the long incus process. And seal uh, here with fibrous tissue. Okay, that was a two-minute meditation. Thank you. <laughs>